Uh, welcome everybody for this uh, afternoon or morning or night session, so at least second session in, in the day. Um, and so we are very happy to have uh, Gabriel Lundi, who is going to speak, I don't remember exactly <laughs> on what, but yeah, he's going to, to tell us just now, I guess. So okay. Gabriel, yeah, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your screen. Awesome. And I will mute myself because there's a bit of background and I'm sorry for that. Okay, so it should be working here. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's working. awesome. So uh, first of all, I want to thank Camille and all the organizers of this workshop for, for giving me the chance to present here. It's fantastic. Um, um, unfortunately, I, you know, this was uh, online, so I couldn't visit the, um, the group in, in South Africa, but hopefully uh, there will be plenty of time for that in the future. So, so I wanted to, to tell you today about some work that I've been doing on this idea of informational steady states uh, in continuously monitored systems. Uh, and my name is Gabriel Landi, I'm from the University of Sao Paulo. So, so the work that I'm going to present was done in collaboration with two groups. So there was a group in Belfast uh, from Auto Paternostro, then Alessio Belenka and Luca Mancino. Um, and also there was an experimental group from uh, the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. It was Massimiliano Rossi and uh, Albert Schlieser. And uh, it, this is summarized in these three papers. Uh, uh, and I wanted to focus mostly on this one, which is a paper in preparation that uh, I'm very excited about, which kind of generalizes uh, this, this one, which was kind of preliminary first results. And then there's also this paper, which is uh, an experimental paper, uh, um, providing an experimental assessment of some of the things that I'm going to, to talk about. So, okay, this is the, the starting slide. It's a little bit um, uh, dense, but let me, let, let's go through it uh, in, in detail. So the typical scenario that I'm going to think about uh, during, uh, throughout this entire talk is going to be this one. So you have some system, which I'm going to call X, uh, and some bath that you're going to call Y. And essentially, they start uncorrelated, and they interact uh, through some unitary U. So uh, this is the typical map that uh, I will be thinking about um, uh, during this course, is during this talk. Um, initially, they're uncorrelated. You use an arbitrary unitary, and then you get a correlated state uh, rho x, y prime. And, and so the, the prime here always denotes things uh, after the interaction. So this kind of, 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 of map is, is, um, is actually quite interesting, and it's quite general, because there, there's um, a very large number of processes in nature which can be captured by this kind of structure. I mean, this could be just uh, uh, an atom interacting with the electromagnetic vacuum, maybe uh, a qubit interacting with another qubit, or it could be just two macroscopic bodies interacting with each other. Maybe something like, you know, a, a, a hot sword when you dip it in, in water, like in those, in those uh, epic movies that they're making the swords in the blacksmiths and they dip the hot sword in a bucket of water. I mean, this is, would still be captured by this kind of map. Uh, admittedly, it, it would be a very complicated unitary, right? So this part would be uh, tremendously complicated, but still from a formal point of view, uh, um, um, even many body interactions are still captured by this kind of structure. Now, uh, I will not make any specific assumptions about the bath, and I will not necessarily assume that the bath is thermal. It is possible to formulate the second law of thermodynamics, even in this case. Yeah, uh, traditionally, the second law is formulated for thermal systems and interacting with thermal baths and so on. But there is this uh, by now quite famous um, um, uh, formulation by, by Esposito, Lindenberg, and Van den Broek, uh, which um, write down a, a second law for this generic process with a generic environment. And the idea is to write the entropy production um, as this, uh, which is a, the basic quantity characterizing the second law as a contribution of two terms. So the first term is the mutual information that the system and bath they develop. So uh, it, it's the mutual information of this final state here. Uh, so, and so it captures the, the correlations that system and bath develop due to the unitary. 
And the second term, term is the, the relative entropy of the BEF state. So, so th this relative entropy is a measure of distance and it's therefore quantifying uh, how, how the state of the bath uh, before and after the interaction differs. So how much you push the bath from equilibrium because it interacted with the system. Now, what is interesting about this is that um, uh, by just doing sort of uh, straightforward manipulations, we can rewrite this into this form uh, where S of X prime and S of X are the entropies of the system before and after the, the uh, interaction. So, so S of X would be minus trace of row of x log of row of x and similarly for for the um, final state and phi is what we call the entropy flux uh, which is a quantity that depends only on the bath so so the entropy flux is essentially um, uh, a, a change so it's like a, a initial minus final is a change of the thermodynamic potential log of rho y right so uh, and i'm writing this because in principle, uh, rho i is arbitrary. If you happen to have the state of the bath to be a thermal state, then this flux becomes beta times q. So, so uh, if the, the bath is thermal, you recover the usual structure of thermodynamics where the entropy flux is associated to heat flux. Otherwise, you get a generic entropy flux, which is not necessarily um, um, uh, associated to heat. So I like this formulation very much. It's, it is quite general and allows you to extend thermodynamics beyond uh, uh, thermal baths. So beyond, beyond the, the standard uh, thermal scenario, so to speak. Okay, uh, but now I wanna talk about a different concept which will be the central concept of this uh, talk, which is this notion of conditional entropy production. So uh, the entropy production is uh, essentially a quantity that is measuring the, the degree of irreversibility of a process. It's quantifying irreversibility. Now, part of this irreversibility is actually associated to our ignorance about the environment. So we don't know exactly what state the environment is. And, and so part of the irreversibility is associated with, with this ignorance. So a conditional entropy production is the entropy production given that, so conditioned on, a measurement on the environment. So the idea is that we start with that final state after they interact, and then we apply a measurement only on the bath. So we have a set of measurement operators acting only on the bath, uh, uh, and therefore we update the state. Um, uh, instead of having row prime of x, y, we have row prime of x, y given a certain outcome z. So this z is the outcome uh, of the measurement that you get. And so this is, is a conditional state, is a, is, a, is a joint state of system plus bath conditioned on a measurement on the bath. Um, now we can then ask, you know, what is going to be the entropy production and flux conditioned on these outcomes? So, so given these, the, that we did a measurement, uh, um, uh, how can we define entropy production and flux? So the idea, the, the proposal, so to speak, is to, uh, um, attempt a, a, a construction of, a, of a, a quantity of the following form. So we want to define an entropy production which is conditional and an entropy flux that's conditional, which is associated to what is called the quantum classical entropy, conditional entropy, apologies. So this, this guy here is the average of the conditional state of system given measurement over all outcomes of the bath. So, so this is, is a quantum classical because uh, we're talking about the entropy of the system conditioned on a measurement on the bath. So we never directly measure the system. This, this is a, a kind of passive construction. It's passive because the measurement never affects the system. So uh, it only measures the bath. So, so this conditional entropy, for instance, is always positive, no negative. Um, the quantum conditional entropy can be negative, but in this case, we never get that. We get a, a uh, this is a, a, the entropy of a quantum system conditioned on classical outcomes. But then the question is, how do we define these things? So, so how do we define um, um, a sigma C and a phi C? So this is just a, a proposal formula. The, 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 the tricky question is, how do we define these quantities? Now, a natural generalization of the flux would be given by this. So the idea is we take the same formula as before. Let me write it down. So we had a formula which was trace 
of rho y minus rho y prime log of rho y. And um, instead of looking at the conditional flux, uh, sorry, at the flux for the final state rho y, we do the same thing for each outcome z. So for each possible outcome z, we compute the flux associated to that conditional final state, and then we average overall outcomes. So if we do this, we can actually rewrite this in this form. So the sum over z in this first term, it drops out. But then in the second term, uh, uh, we get this new state rho tilde. So rho tilde is the reconstructed state, right? So this is kind of a, a reconstructed state of the bath. So, so what we have is essentially uh, um, uh, with different weights, with different probabilities pz, the conditional states uh, after the interaction. Now, very often, um, uh, these so, two, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry, Gabriel. There is uh, two question. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So the first one is what is the role of the measurement here, and how do we measure the system so that it only affects the bath? Okay, so so that's a very good question. So the idea here is that the measurement has a, a passive role in the sense that we measure the bath. So if we go back to this picture, the idea is that um, after they interact, we come here and we measure this guy, right? So we only measure this part. So that's why I say it's passive because the measurement is never going to really uh, have a back action directly on the system. It's only going to measure the, the bath. But if we know something about the bath, we update our information about the system. So, so the knowledge we have about the system is, is changed. I mean, our, of the state of the system is changed if we observe a certain outcome of the bath. So, so this is the, the, the basic idea of the role of the measurement. As for the second question, um, how do we measure the system so that it only affects the bath? So the idea is given by, by this kind of, of, of mathematical structure. So M are measurement operators. You can imagine that they are projectors, for instance, but they act only on the Hilbert space of the bath, not on the system. And let me also clarify what I mean by do not affect the system, because this is a little bit subtle. So this state here, rho x prime given z, is different than rho x prime. So this is the final state of the system if no measurement is performed. And this is the final state of the system given that an outcome z was observed. However, what I mean by does not affect is the following. Uh, if we sum over all z of p of z rho of x prime given z, this is rho of, of x prime. So uh, we say that there is a conditional back action, but not a unconditional back action. So uh, if we given a certain outcome, uh, th then our information about this, the state of the system changes. But if we average overall outcomes, then we just get back the original state. So there's never a, a unconditional back action. And this, in the end of the day, is just a property of no signaling, nothing more. I mean, if we measure the bath here, uh, we cannot signal information to the system. So that condition is, is nothing more than a no signaling uh, theorem. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. I think this was a good point, important point. Cool. So, and then there's also another question here. Uh, so, so if there is no back action, then how does it supply energy? So, so it doesn't, right? So the, the, um, the measurement on the bath will never supply energy to the system. Um, and this also leads me to this next question, which is related to the um, entropy flux. So there can be still a flow of entropy, uh, which is different. So, so in principle, the conditional entropy flux uh, can be different from the unconditional entropy flux. However, it very often the um, reconstructed state is such that uh, um, it's elements in the basis of the initial state are not affected. And so when this is the case, then the conditional and unconditional fluxes coincide. So this is what happens mo for most measurements, which is to say that this flow of entropy is a physical quantity. So uh, by just acquiring some information about the bath, it shouldn't affect how much entropy flows between system and bath. So, so this is the kind of idea. You could develop, you could um, uh, devise a measurement strategy which does not satisfy this. 
but uh, uh, this would be a kind of invasive measurement strategy in the basis of the initial state. So for most choices of measurements, this will be uh, the equal. And so the conditional and unconditional fluxes are the same. So, so this leads to this important distinction between uh, entropy flux and entropy production and entropy. So we have all these three things. Now, uh, I think these two formulas summarize this quite well. Um, so the unconditional, and now I put a, a, a subscript U here. So the unconditional entropy production is just a change in entropy plus the flow of entropy. The conditional entropy production, on the other hand, is the change in conditional entropy, but with the same flow. So the phi is the same in both of them. But this does not mean that these two quantities will be the same. In fact, in general, they will be different. And their difference is precisely this, this uh, mismatch between the conditional and unconditional entropies. And this is called the Holeva chi quantity. So it's a central quantity that appears in information theory, uh, um, uh, which is exactly associated to this idea that we have x, we have y, we put them to interact, and then we ask, you know, how much can we learn about x given that we measure i, y? And so this is the, the, uh, the idea behind this Holevo information. So uh, uh, as we can see, the, the connection between um, uh, conditional and unconditional thermodynamics is precisely the Holevo uh, information. Now, uh, the calculations that I just presented, they are uh, shown in this review paper that I put out recently with Mauro Paternostrum. And there are also a, a couple more papers that I wanted to mention. So, so there is a, 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 a similar, but not, not um, exactly the same development that was done in this uh, seminal paper by Funo, Watanabe, and Weda, uh, and which is, was also probed experimentally in, more recently by, by the group of Cater Merch um, uh, in a superconducting uh, circuit. So the, 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 the Fun, this Funo, Watanabe, Weda formulation is a little bit different. Uh, I will unfortunately will not have really a lot of time to go into the details of the differences, but it is definitely related, especially in, in philosophy, but uh, the, the way we formulate thermodynamics is a little bit different. Uh, okay, uh, some properties that uh, one can mention about this conditional entropy production. So first of all, it is bounded between zero and the unconditional uh, entropy production. So this is, I think, very, very nice. First, the fact that sigma c is positive means that the conditional entropy production is still satisfies a second law. So there's still a second law of thermodynamics, even if you condition on the measurement outcomes. And second, the fact that sigma c is always smaller than sigma u means that conditioning makes the process more reversible. So this is really a, a, a bonus. If we measure the bath afterwards, we get a little bit extra information. And so the, the process is a little bit more reversible. Uh, and so we can always do better uh, even if we get very little information about the BEF, uh, by conditioning on the outcomes of the BEF, we always improve uh, uh, on the unconditional case. Oh, I see there's a question by Gonzalo. Yeah. Hey, Gonzalo. Yes. Uh, so is this framework equivalent to the framework of quantum trajectories? Right. So that's a good point. Uh, um, um, a little bit, yes. Uh, I, I think this will be clarified in, in my next slide. So, so um, um, uh, it is definitely related to quantum trajectories, uh, but the connection will become clear uh, later on. But right now, I mean, the, the idea is that you only have one system interacting with one bath, and to get more like quantum trajectories, we're going to make the system interact with multiple bath units, and then the quantum trajectories are going to appear. So I, I, I should be able to clarify that in a second. Okay, so... Um, now we, we come to the, to, to the main contribution of, of, uh, of our work, which is on this idea of extending what I just said to continuously measured systems. So uh, before we had one system interacting with one bath, and now we're going to assume that the system is constantly measured. So we're going to do this using a notion, uh, the notion of collisional models, which I'm going to explain. Um, and so we're going to call this a CAN squared, which is the continuously measured collisional model. So the typical scenario where you find exactly this construct is in quantum optical experiments. So this is very common in quantum optics. You have a system which is inside some kind of optical cavity and you have some photons coming in and some photons going out. So you pump the cavity and some photons leak out of the cavity. 
Now, by measuring the photons that leak out of the cavity, you're con continuously monitoring the system. It's a continuous weak monitoring because each, each photon click will not give you a lot of information. So, so you don't get a, a lot from one photon click. But by combining many photon clicks uh, over time, you, you get a continuous monitoring uh, of whatever your system inside the cavity is doing. Now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to model this using the notion of collisional models. And so the idea is to replace this by a series of collisions, a series of sequential interactions, where the system now interacts with small bits, which we're going to call ancillas. So this would be the, the ancillas. And so the idea is that uh, the system comes in and interacts with ancilla number one. So there's a unitary here. And then uh, it interacts with ancilla number two and then ancilla number three and so on. So it always interacts with like individual small systems. Uh, and then we measure these ancillas. So we measure them in the end. Now, and this is, would be the, the sort of description of a single collision. So uh, ancilla comes in, interacts with the system, goes away. Now this model may seem artificial, but it turns out it is not. Uh, if you go back to this cavity uh, problem, which is again, uh, very common in experimental quantum optics, you can actually um, discretize the, the field operator, the electromagnetic field operator, and you can write a discrete version where you, you discretize it into time bins. Like there's like small time windows that you discretize the electromagnetic field. And if you do that, uh, uh, you get exactly a collisional model. So you can actually map this kind of problem exactly into a collisional model, which is super nice. Uh, and the reason why I, I love collisional models is because they give you full control over what you're doing. So you really know uh, who is interacting with whom, what are we measuring, what are we doing? So we really have full control over the entire dynamics. Now, uh, here is a, a kind of a diagrammatic uh, description of the process. So the system is going to evolve. So the system is X, right? This is the this is this system. And the system evolves uh, from X0 to X1 to X2 is, is what we call a discrete time evolution, a stroboscopic evolution. So the system evolves in this way, and it does so by interacting with ancillas. So at time zero, uh, the system at X0 couples with ancilla Y1, uh, and they interact through a unitary. Uh, and this leads the system to a state X1 and the ancilla to a state Y1 prime. And then, what we do is we measure this state. So the system is never measured. It's, it's here uh, uh, just evolving, but each time the system interacts with an ancilla, we then come and measure the ancilla. So we have the measurement operators, which gives us a series of outcomes. So this is what is called a, a hidden Markov model. Markov model. So the idea is that, um, the system is the hidden part. So this part is hidden. Oh, sorry. Um, let's see. Yeah. This part is hidden. We, we don't really have access to it. I mean, this part, we don't know what's happening here. What we know is, is this part over here. So, so uh, we, we get information about this visible layer. So this is the hidden layer. This is the visible layer. We get information about the hidden layer from making measurements in the, in the visible layer. And the idea, what is uh, especially nice about this continuous monitoring is that we now get not only one outcome, not only one number, but we get a, a record of outcomes. So we get a, a kind of a tape with a bunch of numbers on it, uh, which are the different outcomes. And so we are all constantly measuring the system forever, We're constantly measuring. And so we get an infinite tape of outcomes here. And this can lead, lead as, as I will demonstrate in a second, to some very nice uh, um, uh, features. OK, and then answering Gonzalo's question, uh, what about quantum trajectories? Well, the, the trajectory here is really a, a classical trajectory in the sense of the outcome. So the trajectory is, is um, uh, these a uh, uh, series of, of outcomes, Z1, Z2, and so on, this is the trajectory. You never really get a quantum trajectory for the system, right? Because you never really measure the system to know exactly which state it is in. You only measure directly the map. So you do get a trajectory. It's not the standard quantum trajectory sense, uh, sense because we never know the state of the system. The state of the system is always hidden. OK, so many of the formulas uh, that I wrote before, they naturally generalize to this case. 
So first, the, the evolution of the system is now given by this kind of uh, stroboscopic max, map, so, so a discrete time map. At each step, the system couples to a fresh ancilla, and we make both of them interact, and then trace out the ancilla. And this gives you the new state of the system. And this ancilla will never participate in the dynamics again. So, so uh, ancilla only collides with the system once. And we, we monitor the information about the system by just monitoring the evolution of the von Neumann entropy. Uh, similarly, the conditional dynamics is, is quite similar. We first couple the system to the ancilla, um, but then after interacting, we put in a measurement operator, again, acting only on the state of the ancillas. And so in addition to the unitary, we have this measurement operator, and then we trace out the ancillas. And this will give us a conditional map, which is a map from x t minus 1 given zeta t minus 1 to x t given zeta of t. So the evolution of the state is something like this. t minus 1 goes into x t given zeta of t. So zeta of t, just to remind you, zeta, um, let me go back here one sec. Zeta is this guy, is the, the entire measurement record. So uh, it's important that we distinguish between Z and Zeta. Z is one outcome. So you get one number, like a zero or a one. And Zeta is a vector of numbers. So it's the string, the entire string of numbers. Now, at time T, you already have T numbers associated. So the conditional state is X of T given Zeta of T. It's you're conditioning on the entire, the entire track record of the system. And the uh, information about the system is now monitored again by a quantum classical conditional entropy, which is a sum over all possible trajectories of the outcomes times the entropy of each outcome. And their difference is the Holevo information. So once again, we have uh, uh, exactly like before that their difference is a non-negative quantity, which is the Holevo information. Now, what is nice about this is that it allows us to split the change in Holevo information uh, into an information gain and a loss rate. So here's the idea. Going back here, one sec. So what this quantity is, is the information that we have about the system from the measurement outcomes at time t. So this is the, the net information. What is more interesting to work with is the information rate so this would be, would be a rate of information. It's a rate because it's the change in time, so in one collision. So it's how much information uh, changes in time. And so this quantity can have any sign. While i is positive, this difference doesn't have to be positive or negative. It can have any sign because maybe in one, from one collision to another, you gain more information or you lose information and so on. So the net information is positive, but the rate does not, doesn't have to be. Uh, and so the idea would be, can we now split this rate into a gain rate and a loss rate? The, the reasoning being that um, if this delta i is positive, is because some information was gained. But if it is negative, is because of some noise that was introduced in the dynamics. And so the idea is to split it into a g minus l, where both g and l are positive. And the way we do that is by introducing the conditional mutual information, which is the, the mutual information between the system and the last outcome given the entire record. So, so for a fixed uh, past record, we talk about the correlation that the system developed with the latest outcome, so just with the last one. And this quantity is always non-negative. The loss rate, on the other hand, is given by the information between, the Holevo information between the, the system and, and uh, outcomes at the past, and the system one step further, but without updating the state of the past. So this is not xt zeta of t is xt zeta t minus one. So this gives this gives this idea of, of how much noise is introduced if no measurement is updated. And this quantity, we also show that it's positive. So, so now we have uh, um, a, a very nice splitting of the dynamics of the information rate into a gain rate and a loss rate. And this, in particular, introduces something which I am quite fascinated at the moment, which is this notion of an informational steady state. Now, an informational steady state 
it is a steady state because the, the, the rate at which we gain information no longer changes. So the change in whole level information is, is, is uh, over. It's no longer changing. However, saying that delta i is 0 doesn't mean that g is 0 and l is 0. It could also mean that g is equal to l, but they're both different from 0. So if the rate at which you gain is equal to the rate at which you lose, then you're still going to be in a steady state, but it's going to be an, a non-trivial steady state because you're constantly gaining information and you're constantly losing information. Um, and so we can define this as an informational steady state. The steady state is only maintained, it only exists because we are doing measurements. If we stop measuring, then we lose the steady state. But uh, as long as we keep on measuring, we keep the system in this informational steady state. And I will show you uh, uh, a few examples in a second. But just before going into the examples, let's just uh, briefly re recap the second law. So um, the, the expressions that I have here for the unconditional and conditional entropy predictions, they are very similar to what we had before. The only difference is that they now refer to rates because they refer to single collisions. So it, whereas before we had just one collision, here we have multiple. So uh, the unconditional entropy production is the change in entropy plus flux. And the conditional one is the change in conditional entropy plus flux. And again, these two fluxes are the same uh, for the same reason. Uh, and so the conditional entropy production is the unconditional one minus the, the, the whole level rate, the rate in whole level information. And so in an informational steady state, the conditional entropy production rate must be equal to the unconditional one. Okay, so uh, now I want to go through a couple of examples, which I think that really clarify uh, the basic ideas. So the first example I'm going to consider is, uh, it would be a, a, perhaps the, the simplest example one can think of, is this situation where the system is a qubit and the ancillas are a qubit, uh, and they interact with some kind of partial swap. So just a, a swap interaction, this simple like uh, exchange interaction. Now, um, uh, and I'm going to assume that this, the ancilla is prepared in a thermal state and the system is prepared in an arbitrary state. Now, uh, the idea is, uh, so here I begin by showing the, the conditional and the unconditional, sorry, the, the unconditional and the conditional entropies. So you see, the system is in some, some arbitrary state. So as soon as these collisions start, the, the system is going to evolve. And so the entropy is going to change. And so unconditionally, so blue means we never measure, unconditionally, the entropy goes up and saturates at some finite value. This finite value is essentially the, the entropy that the system has when it thermalizes with the ancilla. So, uh, in each collision, the idea is that the ancilla swaps a little bit of uh, its state with the system. And so in the long time limit, the system thermalizes. So x thermalizes when t goes to infinity. So in each collision, there's only a small sort of a um, exchange of, of um, information, but uh, in the long term, it thermalizes. So the blue curve is essentially the entropy after it thermalized. And the uh, orange one is now the conditional entropy. So as you can see, the conditional entropy is always less because we know we, it's, it's a little bit of extra information. So entropy is our uncertainty about the state of the system. This guy has to be smaller than this one. It's, it, I mean, measuring the path can only lead to a bonus. So this guy must always be below this guy. But in this example, uh, these two quantities, they tend to the same state. So even if we condition on... Now here uh, I show the, um, um, the rate of information and the gain rate and loss rate. So uh, if we follow first the blue curve, initially uh, the, the information that we get is, is significant. So this, the blue curve is initially positive and big, right? Uh, but then as time goes on, we start acquiring less and less information because the system is thermalizing. So the, the amount of information we, we, we gather is actually going down. A at some point, it actually becomes negative, meaning that we're, uh, we're losing information. So, so uh, essentially by doing the measurements, the net information that we have is actually going down. And eventually this saturates at zero. So the blue curve always goes to zero because there's a steady state. It goes to a steady state, things stop. But now, uh, if we look at the orange curve for the gain rate, 
we see that it's always positive because I mean, these two guys, they're always positive or, or should I say non-negative. So they're always non-negative. And initially you gain a lot of information, but then uh, uh, as time moves on, as time passes, you, you gain less and less information until in the end you don't gain anything. So the gain rate tends to zero. And uh, conversely, finally, the, the, the uh, green curve, initially uh, there's a significant amount of loss, but the loss is still smaller than the gain. So this guy is positive. But as time moves on, the loss becomes larger than the gain. So this guy becomes negative, And again, the, it tends to zero. Now, before I turn into these other plots, uh, forget, forget them for a second. Please focus on these, these two plots, because I want to show another example, which I think nicely contrasts to this one. So, so the idea here is that, is that there is no informational steady state. There is no informational steady state because G tends to zero and L tends to zero. So the, the gain rate tends to zero. So there is no information steady state, it's just a thermal state. Now I want to show another example, which is very simple, but much more interesting. Uh, instead of considering the ancilla to be composed of one qubit, we're going to assume that the ancilla is actually composed, it has a, 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 a internal structure, so to speak. So the ancilla is composed of two qubits. I'm going to call them y1 and y2. Uh, the first qubit, I'm going to assume that it's in a thermal state. And the other qubit, I'm going to assume that it, it is in the plus state. And moreover, I'm only going to measure one of them. So I, I measure only this qubit and I never measure this guy. So I have the flexibility to do that. Now, why, why, what is the logic? The logic is that uh, this state Y2 is, a, is a, a state with coherence, right? It's uh, is in a superposition. And so it, it kind of res, re, resembles a, a, a resourceful state. It's a, it's a quantum thing. You know, that has some quantum resources. And this guy is just a probe. So it's, it's kind of just a, a probe that you, you couple here to interact with the system and extract some information. So the idea is that you measure this guy, uh, but you don't measure this guy. But of course, this is only for the sake of examples. Uh, we could consider any kind of geometry you wanted to. We could very well measure both of them and so on. Uh, now here, I show again the uh, conditional and the unconditional entropies. And as before, we see that you know, the conditional entropy is always below because conditioning always makes things better. But now what is really interesting is if we analyze the um, uh, information rate and gain and loss rates. So what we see here is that um, uh, the information rate, so the blue guy, it's, uh, it's very similar to what we had before. It starts big, it becomes negative, and it goes to zero. So this is, is an ISS, uh, so it's a steady state. So I'd say this is an SS, right? This is a steady state uh, because the information rate goes to zero. But what is very interesting that we see here that wasn't present before is that these two guys, they now tend to a non-zero value. So you see, they, they don't go to zero, which is here. They, go, they stay above zero. And so this is what characterizes an ISS. So this is an informational steady state. G equals L different from zero. Okay, so so the, this example it shows a a, a, a nice um, illustration of how one can obtain an informational steady state. And although it's not very visible from this plot, the informational steady state is also characterized by the fact that this curve is always smaller than this one. So so the the orange is always below blue. It's not a lot. But it's always below. So, so you tend to have an entropy, an information from the system, which is smaller than the unconditional entropy. And we can even make this even more interesting. Uh, so I'm going to consider now the same example, but with a different initial condition. So here, sorry, here the initial condition was, was kind of random. It just took the, the system to be in the, in the ground state. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to assume that the system starts in the unconditional steady state. Sorry, this is wrong. In the unconditional steady state. So here's the idea. Let me try to explain this in detail because I think this is really beautiful. Suppose we let the system evolve. So the system is evolved with these maps. Um, 
these stroboscopic uh, collisional model maps. So we let the system evolve for a long time. So meaning we allow these collisions to happen for a long time and we don't measure. We just collide, 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 and we don't measure. Now, uh, after a, a very long time has passed, the system will tend to um, uh, an informational, st uh, 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 unconditional steady state, sorry, rho x star, which is just the fixed point of this map. So we, we let it relax to this fixed point. And now, suddenly, we turn on the measurement. So we start acquiring information. So it's like for, for a long time, we don't turn this on. And then it's at a certain point, we turn this guy on suddenly. So what is going to happen is that the unconditional entropy doesn't change anymore. So this blue part is, is fixed, but the conditional entropy goes down. So you see, as soon as we start measuring, the system cools down. So the system cools down. Oops, cools down. Right? Which is which is quite nice. So so uh, uh, we acquire information, and so our uncertainty about the system just cools down. It, it uh, uh, the entropy uh, becomes smaller, and we also see this in the information rates. So again, when we turn this on, delta i is non-zero, but it goes to zero. But then these two guys, they are non-zero, non-zero, and they tend to non-zero values. So they tend here to be equal but non-zero. So this is the basic idea of these uh, informational steady states. Um, I see that I'm running a little bit out of time. Camille, so the idea would be for me to talk until when? Um, it would be to talk until uh, 20 past. 20 past, okay, perfect. So that, that... You had like 10 minutes more or less. Okay, perfect, that, that's plenty of time, okay. So, um, I'm, I'm actually going to move on. Uh, this is an example that I'm not going to talk about, which would be to extend these ideas to the single shot scenario, to talk about you know, the statistics of entropy and entropy production within a single stochastic realization. But unfortunately, I won't have a lot of time to talk about this. And so I wanted to move on to this um, experimental paper that we did, which is an experimental assessment of these very ideas. Now, this was done in the group of um, uh, Albert Schließer in Copenhagen. Uh, and what they have there is an optomechanical system. So essentially you have an optical cavity, which is, uh, this is a mirror, this is a mirror. And inside the cavity, there's, there's a membrane. So this, this thing here in the middle is a very thin uh, membrane, uh, which can vibrate. So this thing can vibrate uh, back and forth. Um, and the idea is that you're going to pump the cavity with a laser. And part of the, this uh, light is going to leak out and be re uh, recorded here. So it's, it's exactly that same idea that I mentioned in the beginning, but with the system in the middle being a mechanical um, mode of vibration. Now, uh, in this case, uh, the system is essentially characterized by position and momentum operators, uh, but these turn out to be the same. So the, the setup is chosen such that the averages of the position and momentum are, are always the same. And so we can just think about one of these numbers. Right? And so we have essentially uh, the average uh, position, uh, which uh, in the long term tends to zero. So on average, this membrane tends to zero position. And we have the variance uh, of the position. So this is, is the variance of X. Um, and so the idea is that uh, in the long time limit, the unconditional dynamics tends to uh, have a variance, which is given by this. And let me allow me to explain the, the different terms here. So this, this n bar is, is the thermal occupation of the mode. Occupation. So it's essentially the thermal bath that is in here. There's a thermal bath here. Um, but in addition, there's also another bath acting on the system, which is the, the, the optical mode. So essentially the system is coupled to two baths, the, the, the mechanical resonator, sorry. Um, yeah. The mechanical resonator is coupled to two baths. On one side, you have the thermal bath, oops, sorry, thermal. And on the other side, you have the optical bath. Uh, and so the idea is that 
um, this system will naturally tend to a non-equilibrium state because there's a competition between the, the thermal bath that is acting on the membrane and the optical bath, which is pumping photons and making these photons interact here with the system. And so this is described by this other term here, gamma QBA is a constant associated to the optical bath. So this is associated to the optical bath. Whereas this guy is a constant associated to the uh, thermal bath, and, um, um, to, to this, this standard thermal bath. And so we see that the unconditional dynamics tends to a state which uh, is, has a, a, a thermal occupation, which is larger than just the, the, the occupation of the bath. It's a disoccupation of the bath plus an extra bonus associated to the optical bath. But now one can also study the con conditional dynamics. And in, for, to do this, one can use the, the framework of um, uh, Gaussian continuous measurements, which is a very um, sort of well-developed framework for describing uh, quantum optical experiments and so on. And essentially the, the uh, position is going to evolve according to a Langevin equation. So this is a Langevin equation. Whereas the conditional variance will evolve according to a nonlinear equation called the Riccati equation. And so here we see that the conditional variance is associated with uh, a mismatch between conditional and unconditional variances, but also it is reduced by a term associated to this QBA. So this is associated to a reduction on the variance. due to measurement. And this eta is the measurement efficiency. So the efficiency of the measure, of the measurement. Okay, so uh, here this plot shows very nicely um, what, what happens when we start measuring. And this is similar to the two, two qubit example that I showed before. Uh, essentially the system uh, it starts hot and as soon as you start measuring, it cools down. So, so by measuring the position of the mechanical oscillator, you can actually cool down the system because you, you have extra information about where the system is. Uh, yeah, and so this, sorry, this, this drawing turned out to be not so good, but this is, will now tend to be to an informational steady state exactly because uh, the conditional variance is going to be smaller than the unconditional one. And finally, uh, we show here the thermodynamics of this model. So what I present here is the entropy flux and the entropy production along individual stochastic trajectories uh, as a function of time. And, and the, the, the darker blue curve are the averages. So the average conditional and the average um, uh, conditional flux and conditional entropy production. So this means we can, uh, 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 we can quantify the entropy production at the level of specific trajectories uh, within this mechanical resonator. And finally, we show here the information rate, the gain rate, and the loss rate. So we see that uh, the information rate, uh, and apologies, this is supposed to be minus the information rate. It's defined with an opposite sign. So it's initially negative. In, in my previous definition, it was positive. So it's negative, but it tends to zero. But the gain rate, which is this curve down here, it tends to a non-zero value. So again, this is an ISS because we have G equals L different from zero. So this is at least to acknowledge the first assessment of uh, entropy production in a continuously monitored system uh, uh, at the level of stochastic trajectories, uh, uh, quantum trajectories. So with this, I stop. Uh, sorry for taking a bit longer than I anticipated. So. Um, uh, I introduced, I, I talked a lot about this idea of conditional entropy production, which is kind of the take home message from, from this um, uh, talk. Um, and essentially the conditional entropy production quantifies um, how knowing something about the path makes the process less irreversible, so more reversible. And we introduced a framework for doing this using con uh, continuously monitored collisional models. And what I like most about this framework is that it allows us to understand these informational steady states, which I think are super nice and are uh, um, um, a nice generalization of the concept of non-equilibrium steady states that are frequently studied in um, quantum theory, uh, but now is a steady state that is maintained only by the act of measuring. So we have to measure the system to keep it in a steady state. And we also provide an experimental assessment of that in an optomechanical system. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much, and I'm open for questions.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel, for this uh, very nice talk. Um, we have question, yes. Uh, so, Thiago. Um, yeah, sorry, Elia, can you? Uh, I'm always <laughs> confused how to. Hi. To, oh, yes, oh, okay, you're already speaking. Yeah, so please, Thiago, uh, you can ask your question. Hi, thank you, Gabriel. So, I mean, I have, I think, two related questions. I mean, if I understood correctly, so can you see that, I mean, the fact that you have or not this information state states is related to the fact that the, the, the state state that you have in the long time, if it's correlated or not with the math, and, and somehow, I mean, that the fact that you make a measure in the math change or not the state, the state of the math, the system. And this is also another question that, I mean, in the beginning, when you talk about the conditional entropy, because, I mean, is it the quantum conditional entropy or is it the classical one? Because you have this problem of how to make a quantum conditional entropy, which takes you to this, uh, to the discord, you know, would be the difference between the, uh, the two ways to quantize the conditional entropy. And is this discord related somehow? I mean, having or not discord in the state state at the end is related to being able to have this that information state state. Okay. I'm so, not sure I was clear. No, 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 yeah, definitely. So so let me start with the last question, uh, because I will probably forget the first one. <laughs> um, but so so this this would be the quantum classical conditional entropy. So it is not the the the, the quantity you're, you're imagining. Uh, this quantity is always non-negative and it's just um, uh, really associated with this level information. So the question is, you have a system X that is somehow correlated to Y. Now you measure Y, how, what can you learn about X? And so, so this, this entropy here is always non-negative and it's, um, um, it's kind of mixing quantum features with classical probabilities. So it's the, the average, so it's the average of a quantum quantity, the average of the von Neumann entropy, but average over classical probabilities. So it would be different from the, from the um, um, standard conditional entropy. And for the first question, sorry, can you repeat again because I forgot? I was thinking that, I mean, you're saying that, I mean, the, the last thing you were saying that I can let, let the state just evolve and then like to the stationary state. And then if I measure, I start measuring afterwards, if it's changed the entropy, then I would have information in that state. No, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so so you're absolutely correct, Thiago. So also, is this so is this the fact that so can you relate to having or not to the fact that there is some correlations between the I mean, I was thinking about discord. You no, know, the fact that discord is like the fact that if I measure one system, the other is perturbed. So I would say that maybe that's what's happening in this case that you are measuring the path and you are disturbing the system, and that's why you have this state, information state state. You know. Right, so I think it's not related to discord. So it's definitely related to the fact that the system must keep on generating correlations with the ancillas. So in the in the one qubit example, for instance, this there is no information of steady state because the system just thermalizes with the ancillas. So in the long term limit, when you apply the unitary to x and y, you still get a product state in the end. Whereas here, if since you're alternating collisions, so you collide here, 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 here. Uh, the system is never uh, thermalizing with this, this ancilla or with this one. So it's, it's always sort of um, 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 bouncing back and forth between the two states. And so each time you collide, even in the, in the steady state, you're always generating some correlations between X and Y1. And so that would be a, a, an informational steady state. So, but I don't think it's related to this court because uh, we can formulate a classical version of this model. So we actually, uh, uh, we're doing that in the, in the, the upcoming draft. We can formulate a fully classical, uh, incoherent version of this model. And if, if it's fully incoherent, uh, then um, um, uh, there, 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 this part is identical to this. OK, OK, thank you. Cool. OK, is there any more question? Otherwise, I have a question myself. Uh, so yeah, maybe. In the meantime, uh, yeah, so since you are in this slide, so maybe it was what you were, were saying just now, uh, but I just want to make sure. So yeah, you start with this, uh, so uh, epsilon two, uh, sorry, y two uh, uh, in this uh, plus state, 
so they, they are co coherent, as you said. And so what if you take the same state, so the same population, but without coherence, which would be, I guess, the identity? So did you, I mean, did you notice any difference or not? Right, that's a good question. So I, I don't remember exactly. We tried, we tried quite a couple of, of combinations. I mean, this effect can be very small, uh, uh, and these simulations they are not so cheap because this is these are actually stochastic simulations. I didn't have a lot of time to talk about this, but you have to do these simulations by simulating many quantum trajectories. Uh, and if if these effects here like are very small, these curves can be very close to zero, and it becomes hard to distinguish them numerically. So uh, this is one configuration that we found that led to larger results. Uh, but I think that uh, other chances, uh, uh, other scenarios like the one you're suggesting to just use this as the identity, they will still lead to, to, to similar results in principle. Uh, uh, it's just that you know, visualizing them is not so easy. But I think as long as, long as the system is constantly gaining correlations with, with one of the ancillas, you can still in principle um, um, get this effect. It just may be very small. I think there's a, there's a general trend. Uh, so it, this is also related to uh, Thiago's question. So there's, there's this general trend that we don't need quantum correlations. Again, one can formulate a classical version of this model. Mm -hmm. But in general, quantum correlations, they tend to be much larger than classical correlations. Not always, but usually in, for like simple examples, you, we often observe that you know, things that have quantum uh, coherences and so on, the, the mutual informations and so on, they tend to be much larger than if you just use populations. Uh, so this is part of the reason why we chose this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, Basana, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hey Gonzalo, what's up? Hi, hi Gabriel, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I, I will just uh, mention a, a comment about the, the previous question I, ha I had about the framework of quantum trajectories. Mm -hmm. so I, I think the, the, the spirit at least of the framework is very similar, so it, which is this thing of uh, monitoring the environment or parts of the environment in order to get some information about the system without uh, directly disturbing it uh, with uh, direct measurements, right? Mm -hmm. But with, uh, so I, I can imagine that you indeed can obtain a, a stochastic master equation for the for the state of your of your system condition on the measurement outcomes in the in the auxiliary systems, right? Uh, in the equations. Definitely. So 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 we've been kind of focusing, but this is kind of a matter of taste uh, on these uh, non-infinitesimal collisions. So so each collision doesn't have to be like very really infinitesimal. But if you if you if you take this infinitesimal limit, then you do get a, exactly a stochastic master equation. Yeah, I with see. a specific unraveling associate. So the unraveling associated with how you measure the ancillas. Yeah. Okay, and and then it seems to me uh, also crucial, no, that the fact that you can that you have you, you allow measurements that are kind of inefficient, no, the, so that you can lose information. So the disturbance of the measurement can be higher than the than the information that you get from the from the measurement, no. And this is why you have this these two different terms of gain and lose of uh, of of mutual information, right? Because you yeah. can. Uh, yeah, so it's, it seems very nice this thing. So, so, so just complementing that. So, so, so you're absolutely right. So, so this, I mean, the, the measurement is, is just given by a generalized set of measurement operators, uh, uh, and so we can really have any kind of situation where we, the measurement can make things can introduce a lot of noise. But in the end of the day, I mean, uh, in the worst case scenario, you gain zero information. So, in the worst case scenario, uh, I. Sorry, what I mean is this guy is always positive, right? This is the net information that you acquired from, from the entire measurement. So you do an entire measurement and the net information you acquire is, is uh, in the worst case scenario zero, but it's never negative. Uh, but um, uh, uh, the information in each step can, can make things worse. So, so I, I just emphasize this because uh, uh, there's kind of a change in philosophy here compared to, to other works like the work with Puno and uh, Watanabe and Weda, 
which is that we really view this measurement as kind of a, a bonus in the sense that it's it's something extra that you cannot cannot do, but it's not a, really a, a part of the dynamics. Uh, I mean, the system is going to interact with the ancillas anyway, and then you can just choose to measure or not the ancillas, but this interaction is there anyway. This is, is uh, a, really a change in uh, a different philosophy than, than say that the ancilla has an active uh, um, role in, in, in coupling to the system to extract information. And so the, when the ancilla couples to the system and extract information, it can actually make the state of the system more noisy uh, uh, instead of getting useful information. So here, I mean, this noise is going to be introduced anyway. It's just that if you now measure the ancilla afterwards, you can get a, a little bit of extra information. I see, and I have a, just a final question, which is if you thought about uh, some kind of fluctuation theorems with this um, conditional entropy, no? Because, so I mean, you can derive fluctuation theorems when you go fully into the framework of quantum trajectories. For instance, if you go to stochastic Rodinger equations, which is just the limit in which your measurements on the environment allows you to maintain the purity of the of the of the system, no? Because you are uh, retrieving all the information that the that the system is somehow leaking into the environment, and and in that case you can do, but in in these kind of intermediate cases in which uh, you lose some information but you you still keep some part, uh, so I don't know whether you can or not uh, formulate the fluctuation theorems. So mm -hmm. have you thought about it or? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So, so um, we so so the answer would be so, so more or less. Um, uh, so, in in the classical version of the problem, we have formulated a, a fluctuation theorem. So, if you, if you assume classical, completely incoherent, and so on, we were able to formulate some, some version of, of of fluctuation theorem. But admittedly, we haven't really given a lot of thought to that because we've been really sort of playing with this con the informational steady states and so on. I really think that something uh, that uh, would be of interest for like a future study. And in fact, I mean, if you want to chat about it later on, I would, I would, I would like that because, uh, I mean, this is something that is on the to-do list, but we just haven't done it yet. Uh, uh, and I know that, it, the, as you mentioned, this idea that you get imperfect measurements is probably going to, to ruin the fluctuation theorem, but somehow uh, it could be salvageable in some way or another. That would be very cool. We, we could discuss maybe some other time. Yeah, cool, cool. Thank you. Cool, thank you, thank you. Okay, and I think we have one more question from Bassano. Uh, because he raised his hand, but maybe change his mind. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, okay, so otherwise, yeah, I think it is fine. I, I have still more questions, but yeah, we're already a bit over time, so I will I will send you an email <laughs> and we can discuss later. Awesome. So thank, yeah. you, very, thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. And, um, and, uh, and yeah, now 